and they know it. The subjects of the tyrant will join my troops. If I go to Italy with 10,000 men against an Alexander Vi, half of Italy will be for me. If I enter there with 40,000 men against Innocent the Eleven, all Italy will raise itself to drive me out. A good and wise king was never dethroned in England, even by large armies, and all its bad kings succumbed to and quat, usurpers and quat, who begin their campaign with 4,000 regular troops. There is no gain to be had by being malicious with misanthropes, but there is by being virtuous and intrepid with them. You will make your people virtuous like you, neighbors will want to imitate you, and the humanity haters will scramble from the light. Chapter 16. Liberality and Economy You might want to read Chapter 16 of The Prince First Two Famous sculptors, Phidias and Alchemines, each carved a statue of Minerva, and the Athenians wanted to choose the most beautiful, to place it on the top of a column. Both were presented to the public. That of Alchemines gained the most votes. The other, said one judge, was too coarsely worked. Phidias was not disconcerted by the judgment of Vulgar, and asked, seeing as the statues had been made to be placed on a column, that both be raised. Then that of Phidias won the vote. Phidias owed his success to the study of optics and perspective. Rules of proportion must also be observed in policy. The differences of the places put different meanings in the maxims. Applying one of them generally would make it a bad one. What would be admirable for a large kingdom would not be appropriate for a small state. The luxury which is born from abundance and which makes the riches circulate through all the veins of a state, makes a large kingdom flower. It is this kind of principality which both maintains industry and multiplies the needs of the poor. If some skillful policy were wanted to reign in the luxury of a great empire, this empire would fall into economic languor, but the same policy would perish a small state. The money that leaves the country in greater abundance in such a state would not re-enter there in the same proportion. The result would be to drain this delicate body of consumption, and it would not fail to starve. It is thus an essential rule for any policy never to confuse the small states with the large ones, and this is where Machiavel sins seriously in this chapter. The first fault that I must reproach him with is that he takes the word and quot, liberality and quot, in a too vague a direction, he does not distinguish enough liberality from prodigality. A prince, he tells us, to make large things, must be liberal and also must pass for it. I do not know any hero who was not to display avarice says to the men, do not expect anything of me. I will reward your services badly. This extinguishes the heat with which any subject naturally serves their prince. Undoubtedly it is only the thrifty man who can be liberal. It is only him which prudently controls his expenditure that can make good on others. One knows the example of Francis I, King of France, whose excessive expenditure was partly the cause of his misfortunes. The pleasures of Francis absorbed the resources of his glory. This king was not liberal, but spendthrift, and at the end of his life he became miserly. Instead of being a good spender, he put treasures in the trunks, but they were treasures that did not circulate, which are necessary for a full income. Any private individual and any king who does nothing but pile up and bury money, understands nothing of the art of enrichment. It is necessary to make the money circulate to be really rich. The Medicis obtained the sovereignty of Florence only because large Cosmo, the patriarch of the family, 
himself a simple merchant, was skillful and liberal, very miserly as a narrow genius, and I believe that the Cardinal of Retz is right when he says that in the great affairs of state one never should look at his money. The sovereign thus puts himself in a position to acquire much of it by supporting the trade and manufactures of his subjects, so that he will have a much fatter chest in the future, and will be liked and esteemed, provided he does not become a waster by overspending. Machiavel says that liberality will make the prince contemptible. Here is the statecraft of a usurer. But this is how a private man must speak when he mixes with princes to give lessons to them. Chapter 17. Cruelty and Clemency, A.N.D. If it is to be better to be loved than feared you might want to read Chapter 17 of The Prince. First the most invaluable deposit which is entrusted between the hands of the princes is the life of their subjects. Their load gives them the capacity to condemn the lawbreakers to death or to forgive them. They are the supreme referees of justice. The good princes look at this much sought-after capacity as the heaviest weight of their crown. They know that they are as much men as those who they must judge. They know that wrongs, injustices, insults can be repaired in this world, but that a death sentence which is either unjust or simply mistaken is an irrevocable evil. They only become severe to avoid a more annoying rigor they would see if they act differently. They make these sad resolutions only in some extreme cases. The process is similar to that where a man sees that one of his members is gangrenous. In spite of the tenderness which he has for his own skin, he resolves to cut this part of his body off, to guarantee and to save, at least by this painful operation, the remainder of his body. Machiavel brings nothing but whimsy to these so grave, therefore serious, therefore significant things. In his lessons, the life of the men is counted for nothing. Interest, this only God whom he adores, is counted for all. He prefers cruelty to leniency, and he advises young men, fresh into adulthood, to be more callous than all others. The trophy they are told to seek is the reputation of being cruel. They are torturers who place the heroes of Machiavel on the throne, and who maintain them there. César Borgia is the hero of this policy when his former servant seeks examples of cruelty. Machiavel quotes some words that Virgil puts in the mouth of Dido, but this quotation has no context to be taken out of. Virgil makes Dido speak in the same way that somebody else can make Jocast speak in the tragedy of Oedipus. The poet tries to put words in the mouths of these characters that are appropriate for drama. It is thus not the authority of Dido, nor the authority of Jocast, which one can borrow in a book of policy. One needs the example of the great ones, the virtuous ones, the real ones. Machiavel's policy recommends especially the rigor of severity towards the troops. He opposes the indulgence of Scipion to the severity of Hannibal. And Machiavel prefers the Carthaginian to the Roman, and concludes immediately that this rigor is the motor of command and discipline, and consequently the source of an army's triumph. Machiavel does not act in good faith on this occasion, because he chooses Scipion, the softest of all the generals regarding discipline, compares him to Hannibal, and supports severity. I acknowledge that the command of an army cannot be held without severity. How else can the libertines, the cruel, the amoral, the cowards, the overly bold, the coarse and mechanical animals, be kept at their duty if the fear of punishment does not stop them. All that I request on this subject from Machiavel is of moderation. It is true, 
that the leniency of an honest man can degrade into over-kindness. Wisdom shows that severity cannot be dispensed with altogether. But this severity in its rigor is like that of a skillful sailor. One does not see him cutting the sails, nor the ropes, of his vessel when the hatches need to be battened down there by the imminent danger of exposure to the storm or the typhoon. There are occasions where it is necessary to be severe, but never cruel. I would like better, in battle, to be loved by my soldiers, not feared. I come now to his most specious argument. It says that a prince, in trusting himself, should also trust fear. It makes him less vulnerable to being manipulated by his subjects, because the majority of the men are prone to ingratitude, fickleness, lying, cowardice and avarice, and that the prince's love of his subjects is a yoke of dependency, that the mischievousness and the lowness of mankind will make him very gullible, and that fear of the punishment ensures far better that their duties will be observed, that acquiring men's benevolence makes them masters over you, but inducing fear makes you master over them. Thus, a careful prince should depend on himself rather than others. I do not deny that there are men who are both ingrates and easy liars in the world. I do not deny that severity is not in some moments very useful, but I advise that any king whose sole method of their policy is securing obedience through fear, will reign over cowards and slaves. He will not be able to expect great actions of or from his subjects, because anything that was accomplished at all was done by fear and timidity, which will always be carried in their characters, even after the source of the cruelty is dead or deposed. I say that a prince who will have the gift of making his subjects love him will reign in their hearts, since these subjects will find it in their own interest to have him for master. In history there are a great number of examples of grand and history-changing actions which were done by love and attachment. I still say that the fashion of seditions and revolutions appears to be entirely finished nowadays. One sees no kingdom, except England, where the king has anything to fear from his people, and even the English king does not have anything to fear unless he himself raises the storm. I thus conclude that a cruel prince, safe in his isolation, nevertheless exposes himself to being betrayed by the plain exhaustion of his subjects. Since continual cruelty is unbearable. One living under it soon moves from fear to slothdom. This a magnanimous prince never faces, because kindness is always pleasant. His subjects do not force themselves to like it. It should thus be wished, for the happiness of the world, that the prince is no good, without being too indulgent, so that kindness was always to them a virtue, and never a weakness. Chapter 18. Should the princes keep their word? You might want to read Chapter 18 of The Prince first. The tutor of tyrants dares to ensure that the princes can deceive the world by their dissimulation. This where I must start to refute. It is a fact that the public is curious. They are like an animal which sees all, which hears all, and which reveals all that it saw and what it heard. If the curiosity of this public examines the lives of individuals with no responsibilities over them, it is merely for diversion and entertainment, but when it judges character of the princes, it is very much motivated by their own interest. The princes know, far more than other men, the unwritten rules, policies and judgments of the world, including the ones that are in the near future. They are like the different stars in the sky, where the astronomers are inclined to direct their telescopes towards. The courtiers who observe them consider it significant if a mere 
gesture, a glare, or a glance betrays something that the prince's empty mouth will not reveal, and the people and quot get to know them and quot by speculation and guesses. In a word, as the sun cannot cover its spots, no more can the great princes can hide their defects at the bottom of their character to the eyes of so many observers. So the mask of dissimulation would merely overcast the natural deformity of a prince. He would have to keep this mask up continuously, if he raised it. Sometimes, if only to breathe, that one occasion will be enough to satisfy the curious ones. The artifice and the dissimulation will therefore become vain on the lips of this prince. The trick in his speeches and his actions will be useless for him. One does not judge this man on his word anymore. It would be in quot, common and quot, to always call them on it, but if one compares their actions and their speeches, that raised mask will always be in the back of their mind. Falseness and dissimulation, then, simply will not work. One does not play his own character solely. It is also necessary to play the character that the world wants you to be. But they who think of deceiving the public are easily deceived themselves. Sixth Quint, Philip II, Cromwell, had the reputation of hypocritical men and rule benders, but never were thought of as virtuous. A prince, skillful that he is, cannot follow all the maxims of Machiavel to give the appearance of virtue to that who does not have it, by laundering crimes which are clean only for him, and those that are lulled to sleep by his image. Machiavel does not hold up better on the reasons which must carry the princes to cheating with hypocrisy, the clever and false application of the fable of the centaur does not conclude anything. If this centaur had half a human figure and half that of a horse, does it follow that the princes must be crafty and unrestrained? He must really desire well to push his catechism for crime, if he employs such weak arguments, and to seek evidence in the laboratory of fiction. But here is reasoning falser than all that we saw. The policy says that a prince must have qualities of the lion and fox, a lion to demolish the wolves, a fox to dodge the fisherman's net. He concludes that what these animal tales show is that a prince is not obliged to keep his word. Here is a conclusion without premises. Isn't the doctor of crime ashamed of stuttering during his lecture of impiety? If one wanted to lend probity and common sense to the muddled thoughts of Machiavel, here is the most you can make of them. The world is in part like a play, where there are honest players but also the cheating ones who cheat, so a prince, who must play the part he has been assigned, should not be misled when there. He needs to know how to spot cheating during the play, not to practice similar lessons, but to be alerted when it is his turn to be gulled. Let us turn now to the examination of this policy. Because all men are wicked, says the author, and because they break their word continually, you are not obliged either to keep yours to them. Here, firstly, is a contradiction. Does the author not say, one moment after, that the gifted at deception will always find men simple enough to deceive. How do these two agree? All men are amoral, and you will find among them men who are simple enough to deceive. It is quite simply false that the world made up only of the amoral. One would have to be a diligent misanthropist not to see that in any group there are many decent people, and that the great number is neither good nor bad. But if Machiavel had not supposed the world to be full of predators, on what would he have based his abominable maxim? Even if we assume that men are as opportunistic as Machiavel wants them to be, 
It would however not follow that we must imitate them. Mr. Cartouche betrays, robs, assassinates. After much consultation foregone, I conclude from this that Cartouche is a criminal that one must punish, and not that the judges should use him as a role model for their own conduct. If the world had little honor and virtue, said Charles the Wise, it would be in the princes that one should find the traces of them. After the author proves the need for the crime, he wants to encourage his disciples by making easier its commission. And quot. But men are so simple, and quot. He instructs us, and quot. And governs so absolutely by their present needs, that he who wishes to deceive will never fail in finding willing dupes. And quot. Which is reduced to this. Your neighbor is dumb, and you are smart. Therefore, it is necessary that you deceive him, because he is stupid. It is the syllogism for which the schoolboys of Machiavel have pledged allegiance to, and has them coiled to strike. The policy which, as a consequence of its reasoning, increases the ease of crime, promises then the happiness of perfidy. Who else would we see as proof of its practicality but the annoying one, César Borgia, the top dog, the gold medal winner of the amorality event, the keeper of the perfidity. This César Borgia, the hero of Machiavel, was very effective at delivering the misery. Machiavel keeps speaking well of him on this occasion. It is necessary given his starring role in this play, but from where it would have taken him except the criminal register, or the history of the bad popes and Nero's. Machiavel assures us that Alexander Vie, the falsest man and most impious pope of his time, always succeeds in his sea heatings, because he know perfectly the weakness of man, their credulity. I wish to assure the reader that this does not demonstrate the gullibility of man, but that some events and certain circumstances sometimes made a success of the intentions of this pope. The contrast of the French and Spanish ambition, the disunion and the hatred of the noble families of Italy, the passions and the weakness of Louis XII, contributed especially to Alexander's success. Cheating is even provably dumb when it is pushed too far. I quote the authority of a great statesman, Don Louis de Haro, who said, of the Mazarin Cardinal, that he had a great predictability in his policy, he always wanted to mislead. This same Mazarin, wanting to employ M. de Fabert in an embarrassing negotiation with the Marshal of Fabert says to him, and quote, suffer to do it yourself, Monseigneur. I refuse to mislead the Duke of Savoy, more especially as the matter concerns only a trifle. I have made it in the world as an honest man, thus I hold my probity for an occasion where the fortunes of France itself would be swayed. And quote, I do not speak in this moment about honesty or virtue, but am considering only the interest of the princes. I say that it is a very bad policy on their part to be cheating, and to deceive the world. They deceive only one time, and then lose the confidence of all. Lately, a certain power had declared in a proclamation how it was to conduct itself, and later acted in a directly opposite way. I declare that this stratagem is a blow sufficient to entirely alienate others' confidence. The more this advice is followed closely, the coarser the student becomes. The Roman Church, to avoid a similar trap, has fixed the date of qualification for being numbered among the saints at 100 years after their death. This will erase the memory of their defects, and that of their extravagances perishes with them. The witnesses to their life, and those which could speak against them, 
do not remain anymore. Nothing opposes the representation of sanctity that they want to give to the public. Please forgive me this digression. I know full well that there are annoying compulsions, where a prince cannot prevent himself from breaking his treaties and his alliances, but he must separate as an honest man from his allies, give them sufficient notice or warning, and, especially, never use those ends that the safety of his people and an emergency need does not justify. I will finish this chapter by only one reflection. One can't help but notice the kind of servant whose defects merit praise from the hands of Machiavel. It wants the typical king made a born liar, and to crown his dishonesty with hypocrisy. He thinks that people will be both devoted to a prince and revolted from the ill treatments that they suffer from him. There are people who are of this feeling. For me, it seems that they always have these indulgences for errors of speculation, for they do not wish to pursue the corruption of the heart to its conclusion. People will love more and unquote, unsound and quote. Prince who is also an honest man, and who works for their happiness, rather than a and quote, safe and quote, degenerate. This may not be the thoughts of the prince, but these are the actions which make the men happy. Chapter 19. That it is necessary to avoid being mistaken and hated you might want to read. Chapter 19 of The Prince First The hysteria of system building does not only afflict the philosophers, it also crept into the minds of analysts of policy. Machiavel is infected by it more than anybody. He wants to prove that a prince must be malicious and cheating. These are the sacramental words of his religion. Machiavel has all the spite of the monsters which embanks Hercules, but he does not have the force. Therefore, should not one have the bludgeon of Hercules to cut it down? Because what is simpler, more natural and more suitable for princes than justice and kindness? I do not think that it is necessary to become exhausted in arguments to prove it. The policy must necessarily lose by supporting the opposite. Because if it advocates that a prince be strengthened on the throne by cruelty, cheating, treachery, etc., this will be malicious for him, yielding a pure loss. He wants to cover a prince who rises on the throne with all these defects, to strengthen his usurpation, but the author gives him advice which will raise all the sovereigns, and all the republics, against him. Because how a private individual can rise to sovereignty, if not by dispossessing a sovereign prince of his states, or by usurping the authority of a republic, Machiavel is not as wise as the princes of Europe. If he came up with a collection of sea heatings for the use of robbers, he would not have made a work more treacherous that this one. I must however give an account of some sham reasoning which is in this chapter. Machiavel claims that what makes a prince odious, is when he seizes wrongfully the goods of his subjects, and making an attempt on the honor of their wives, breaking the ninth and tenth commandments. It is sure that a prince that is guided by interest, is unjust, violent and cruel, will not be able to miss being hated and becoming odious to his people, but this is not the case. For the errantry of Julius Caesar, called in Rome the husband of all the women and the woman of all the husbands, Louis XIV, who loved women much, August I, King of Poland, who was the proud manager of a movable harem. These princes did not know hatred because of their loves, and if Caesar was assassinated, if Roman freedom inserted so many daggers in his side, it was because of Caesar's talent at usurpation, not because of his talent in seduction. One could support the 
feeling of Machiavel by objecting that the expulsion of the kings of Rome was really a protest against the adulteries of Lucretia, but I answer that it was not the love of the crown prince Sextus for Lucretia, but the violent and contemptuous manner of this love, which gave place to the rising of the Republic of Rome, as this violence awoke in the perception of the people, other violences made by the Tarquin kings surfaced in their eyes too. The Romans then carried out their revenge for all of these crimes. But I must note in passing that the adventure of Lucretia is not a novel, and thus needs adaptation for it to become one. I do not say this to excuse the bed jumping of the princes, for it can be morally bad. I stuck it here to show that this, in and of itself, did not make the sovereigns hated. One glances at how the love lives of the good. Princes are treated like a forgivable weakness, provided that this is not accompanied by injustices. One can make love like Louis XIV, Charles II of England, like King Augustus, but one should imitate neither Nero nor David. Here, this seems to me, is a contradiction in form. And quote. The prince who inspires such an opinion of himself is greatly esteemed, and against one who is greatly esteemed conspiracy is difficult and quote. And in chapter 17 the author notes. And quote. Since love and fear can hardly exist together, if we must choose between them, it is far better to be feared than loved, since his being loved depends upon his subjects, while his being feared depends upon himself. A wise prince should build on what is his own, and not on what rests with others. And quote. Which of both is the true feeling of the author? He speaks the language of oracles, the patter, it should be said in passing, of the cheating ones. I must say, on this occasion, that conspiracies and assassinations are almost gone from the world. The princes are safe on this account. These crimes are yesterday's, but Machiavel's analysis of them is very good. There is at most only the fanaticism of some ecclesiastics to worry about, which can commit such a terrible crime only by using their fanaticism. Among the good things that Machiavel identified at the time of the conspiracies, there are some which turn bad in his mouth, like so. And quot. I say, that the conspirator has to face distrust, jealousy, and dread of punishment which deter him. While on the side of the prince there are the laws, the majesty of the throne, the protection of friends, and of the government to defend him, to which if the general goodwill of the people are added, it is hardly possible that any should be rash enough to conspire. And quote. It seems to me that the political author might not show the best form by speaking about the laws, for his general plan advises only interest, cruelty, despotism and usurpation. Machiavel here makes like the Protestants, who use gladly the arguments of the skeptics to fight the transubstantiation of the Catholics, and then use the same arguments they heard from the Catholics to fight the skeptics themselves. Machiavel thus advises with the princes to cultivate goodwill, to stay their hand for this reason, and to also win the benevolence of the surviving nobles and of the people. He is right to advise them to discharge onto others the master strokes that could attract the hatred of one of these two estates, and to establish, for this purpose, the magistrates, judges between the people and the nobles. He points to the government of France as an excellent model of this. The friend of despotism and of usurpation of authority now approves of the power that the parliaments of France had in the nation's distant past. It seems to me that if there is a government which one could nowadays propose as the model of wisdom, it would be that of England. 
There, the parliament is the referee between the people and the king. And the king has all the capacity to make good but little to make evil. Machiavel then enters a great discussion on the life of the Roman emperors. From Marcus Aurelius to the two Gordians, ending with their immediate predecessor Maximinus. He allots the cause of these frequent changes to the venality of the empire, but this is not the only cause there. Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Galba, Otho, Vitellius met a disastrous end without having bought Rome like Didius Julianus. Venality was the final reason to assassinate the emperors, but the true bottom was the shape of government there. The Praetorian Guards became like the Mamelus. In Egypt, the Janissaries in Turkey, the Streldsi in Moscow, but Constantine broke the Praetorian Guards skillfully. It was the misfortunes of the empire which exposed its masters to assassination and poisoning. I will notice that the bad emperors perished violently, but Theodosius died in his bed, and Justinian lived a happy 84 years. Here is what I insist. It is hard to find cruel princes that are also happy, and Augustus was peaceful only when he became virtuous. The Commodus Tyrant, successor of the divine Marcus Aurelius, was put to death in spite of the respect everyone had for his father. Caracalla could not govern well on the throne. This is what caused his cruelty. Alexander Severus was killed by the treason of Maximinius of Thrace, the man who tried to cultivate the image of a giant, and Maximinius, having raised everyone by his cruelties, was assassinated in his turn. Machiavel claims that a low-born prince is often assassinated as the result of the contempt which others have of his low birth, but this is a great wrong. A high man, who has won the empire by his courage and valor does not have parents anymore. One thinks of his capacity, and not of his extraction. Pupinus was the son of a village sheriff, Probus of a gardener, Diocletian of a slave, Valentinian of a rope maker. They all were respected. The Sforza, which conquered Milan was a peasant. Cromwell, who fixed England and made Europe tremble, was the son of a merchant. The great Muhammad, founder of the most flourishing religion of the globe, was a commercial boy. Samon was a French merchant. Famous Piaf, whose name is still revered in Poland, was elected king with peasants' shoes on his feet, and he was respected during a great number of years. That generals, that ministers and chancellors, are commoners. Europe is made fuller and happier, because these places are given to the deserving. I do not say that to scorn the blood of Wittekind, Charlemagne, and Ottoman. I must, on the contrary, for more than one reason, admire the bloodline of heroes, but I like even more their merit. One should not forget only Machiavel here has mistaken much, when he believes that in the time of Severus it was enough to spare the soldiers to be supported. The history of the emperors contradicts it. The more an emperor spared the intractable Praetorians, the more he felt their force. It was also dangerous to flatter them and to ask them to oppress. The troops today need not be feared for any Praetorianism, because all of them are divided into small bodies who watch each other, because the kings have the right to employ and dismiss any of them, and because the force of laws is established. The Turkish emperors are not exposed to the chalk line, because they do not know yet how to make use of this policy. The Turks are slaves of the Sultan, and the Sultan is the slave of the Janissaries. In Christian Europe, the princes know well that favoring one unit at the expense of all others only causes 
disastrous jealousies and unquat independent unquat interests. The role model of Severus, suggested by Machiavel for those who would rise with the empire, is thus quite as bad as that of Marcus. Aurelius is advantageous for them, possibly. But how can one urge the emulation of Severus, Caesar, Borgia, and Marcus Aurelius at the same time? It would join together wisdom and the purest virtue, with the most dreadful opportunism. I have only one more fact to point out. Caesar Borgia, with his so skillful cruelty, had a career that was full of and quote, negative achievements, and quote, while Mark Aurele, this crown philosopher, always virtuous, never experienced until his death a reverse of fortune. Chapter XX are the fortresses, and several other things which the princes often use, are beneficial, or are harmful. You might want to read chapter 20 of The Prince first. Paganism represented Janus with two faces. This meant perfect knowledge of all that has passed and of the future. The image of this god, taken in an allegorical or mythical direction, very well applies to the princes. They must, like Janus, see behind them in the history of all these centuries which have passed, and which provide them salutary lessons of control and having, and they must like Janus see ahead by their penetration, and this spirit of force and judgment which combines all the reports and all the statistics, and divines, in the present situation, that which will, or might, follow. Machiavel proposes five questions for the princes, especially those which have made new conquests, those whose policy only requires strengthening their possession. It seems directed at counseling hooligans to become more prudent, to combine the past with the future, and to become the servant of reason and justice. Here the first question, should a prince disarm conquered people, or not? It is always necessary to correct Machiavel by explaining how much the manner of making war has changed since he wrote The Prince. Now, always disciplined armies, more or less strong, defend the countries. One would scorn a troop of armed peasants. Sometimes the citizens take up the weapons, and the professionals do not suffer because of it. 2. Prevent any temptation to revolt, one threatens them with the bombardment and the cannon, the and quot, whiff of grape shot, and quot, it appears prudent to disarm the middle class men of a conquered city, especially if one has something to fear from them. The Romans, who had conquered Great Britain, and who could not hold it in peace because of the turbulent and quarrelsome mood of these people, tried to effeminize them, in order to moderate their belligerent and savage instincts, hoping to succeed as in Rome itself. The Corsicans are a people as brave and as stout-hearted as these English. They will be overcome, I believe, only by prudence and kindness. To maintain the sovereignty of this island, it appears to me to be essential to disarm the inhabitants, and to soften their manners. I say in passing that one can see from the example of the Corsicans, whose courage and virtue gives to the men their love of freedom, that it is dangerous and unjust to oppress. The second question rolls on the confidence which a prince must have in his subjects. After having become master of a new state, or in those of his new subjects which helped give him the principality, and even in those of which he is their legitimate prince. If you take a city by intelligence, and by the treason of some citizens, it would be very imprudent to trust the traitors, who probably will betray you. One must suppose that those which were faithful to their former masters, will also be so to their new sovereigns, because they are ordinarily wise spirits. 
settled men who have a stake in the country, who like order and see any change as harmful. One should not, however, give one's trust lightly to anybody. But let us suppose one moment that people who are oppressed and are forced to shake off the yoke of their tyrants call another prince to control them. I believe that the prince must answer with the same confidence that they showed him, and that if he treats those who entrust him with suspicion, it would be a most unworthy ingratitude which they would not miss seeing, nor would it fade from their memory. William, Prince of Orange, kept until the end of his life his friendship and his confidence with those who had put in his hands the reins of government of England, and those which were opposed to him, exiled themselves from their fatherland, and followed King James. In the elective kingdoms, where the majority of the electors are little more than brigands, and where the throne is venal, I agree with what some say, that the new sovereign should, after his rise, slip a payoff to those who were opposed to him, as this has in fact worked with these electors. Poland provides us examples of this. The transactions surrounding the throne are so venal that it seems that this purchase is done at the public markets. The King of Poland, by opening his purse, draws from his path any opposition. He is the master who sways the great families by palatinates, staroftes and other gifts which he confers. But the Poles, like others, have on this subject of the benefits a very short memory, so it is necessary to re-water the plants often. In a word, the Republic of Poland is like the barrels of the Danaid's daughters, condemned to eternal labor for killing their husbands at their father's orders. The most generous king will vainly spread his benefits on them and will never satisfy them. However, though a king of Poland has many favors to grant, he can spare his resources by concentrating his liberalities only on the occasions where he needs the families which he enriches. The third question of Machiavel properly looks at the security of a prince in a hereditary kingdom, if it is better that he maintains union or discord among his subjects. This question could perhaps be relevant in the time of the ancestors of Machiavel in Florence. But in the present I do not think that any prince has adopted any rising rather than mitigating it. I would have only to quote the beautiful, Sir Apology of Marcus Agrippa, by which he joins together the Roman people. The republics however must in some way maintain the jealousy between their members, because if no second party watches over the first, the shape of the government changes into monarchy. There are princes who believe that the disunion of their ministers is necessary for their interests. They think of being misled by a united band of men whose mutual hatred serves as the prince's bodyguard. But if these hatreds produce this effect, they produce also a dangerous strength. If these ministers have to contribute to the service of the prince, they will be thwarted continuously, and they will confuse their particular quarrels with the advantage of the prince and the safety of the people. Nothing thus contributes any more has the force of a monarchy than the union intimate and inseparable from all its members, and it must be the goal of a prince wise to establish it. What I have just answered for the third question of Machiavel, can to some extent be used as a solution to his fourth problem. Let us examine however, and judge in two words, if a prince must ferment factions against himself, or if he must gain the friendship of his subjects. A prince forges monsters when he fights his subjects, even only a small group of them. This is to be done to the enemies of his country, to overcome them. It is more natural, more reasonable, more human to make friends, 
Happy are the princes who know the softnesses of friendship. Happier are those who deserve the love and affection of their people. Where is the justice in the opposite course? We now reach the last question of Machiavel. If a prince must have fortresses and citadels, or if he must get rid of them. I believe I have disclosed my feeling in the 10th chapter for what would work for the small princes. Let us come now to what helps the control of the kings. In the time of Machiavel the world was in a general fermentation. The spirit of sedition and of revolt reigned everywhere. One saw only factions and tyrants. Frequent revolutions made princes build citadels on the heights of the cities, to contain the anxious spirit of the more surly inhabitants. For a barbarian century, where the men grow weary of destroying each other or where the sovereigns have in their states a more despotic capacity, one need not speak any more about seditions and revolts, and one would say that the rising of the spirit, after having worked enough of its magic, becomes quiet. A prince has no more need for citadels to ensure the fidelity of the cities and country. It is not these kind of fortifications which will guard against a prince's enemies, and will ensure the strength of the state. The armies and the fortresses are of equal use for the princes, because if they can oppose their armies to their enemies, they can save this army under the gun of their fortresses in the event of a lost battle, and if the enemy besieges this fortress, this gives them time to regroup and assemble new forces, that they can still, if they pile up them in time, employ to besiege the enemy. The last wars in Flanders, between the Emperor and France, almost became trench warfare. Because of the multitude of the fortified towns, and of the battles of 100,000 men, gained over a 100,000 men, were followed only by the capture of one or two cities. The adversary fled to the countryside, and gained time to repair its losses. Then, the enemy, reappeared again, and quickly called into question last year's victory. In countries where there are many fortified towns, the armies which cover two ground miles will be at war for 30 years, and will gain, if they are lucky, for price of 20 battles, 10 miles of ground. In open countries, the outcome of two campaigns decides the fortune of the winner, and subjects whole kingdoms to him. Alexander, Caesar, Genghis Khan, Charles XII prolonged their glory so long as they found few fortified places in the countries which they conquered. The winner of India made only two sieges in his glorious shifts. The arbiter of Poland never made any more. Eugene, Villers, Marlborough, Luxembourg, were great captains. But the fortresses blunted the brilliance of their successors. The French know the utility of the fortresses well, because from the Brabant to the Dauphine it is like a double chain of fortified towns. The east border of France on the side of Germany is like the opened mouth of a lion, which presents two lines of menacing teeth, a mouth that will swallow all invading troops. This should be enough to show the use of fortified towns. Chapter 21. How the prince must control himself for him to be held in regard you might want to read chapter 21 of the prince first this chapter of Machiavel contains both good and bad. I will raise the faults of Machiavel. I will confirm his observations which are good and creditable. And I will then venture my feeling on some subjects which belong naturally to this matter. The author proposes the example of Ferdinand of Aragon, and Bernard of Milan, as a model. For those who want to be characterized by grand enterprises, and rare and extraordinary actions. Machiavel seeks the marvel in the boldness of the enterprises, and in the speed of the execution. 
That is great. I can say honestly. But is creditable only in proportion as the enterprise of the conqueror is right. And quot. If you win praise by exterminating the robbers, and quot. Said the Scythian. Ambassadors to Alexander, and quot. You then yourself become the largest robber of the earth, because you plundered and ransacked all the nations which you overcame. If you are a god, you must do good for the mortals, and not plunder what they have title to. If you are a man, always remember it. And quote. Ferdinand of Aragon was not always satisfied to make war openly. He found his religion useful, like a veil, to cover his intentions. He misused the faith of the sermons. He spoke only about justice, and made only injustices. This is what Machiavel praises him for. Machiavel pleads, in the second place the example of Bernard of Milan, to insinuate to the princes that they must reward and punish in an inspired way, so that all their actions have a character of grandeur. The generous princes will not harm their reputation, especially when their liberality is a continuation of the size of their soul, and not of their self-righteousness. The kindness of their hearts can make them larger than all the other virtues. Cicero said to Caesar, and quote, you do not have anything larger in your fortune than the capacity to save citizens as well, nor worthier of your kindness as the will to do it and quote. It would thus be necessary that the sorrows that a prince inflicts always spring from an offense, and that the rewards which he gives are always a reward of service. But here is a contradiction. The doctor of policy wants in this chapter for his princes to hold their alliances, and in the 18th chapter he formally released them from their word. He becomes as a teller of great adventures who says white to the ones, and black to the others. If Machiavel reasons badly on all that we have just said, he speaks well of the caution which the prince must have when dealing with other princes who are more powerful, who, instead of helping him, could be his destroyer. It is what every prince of Germany knows, and what the large one uses to estimate his friends and enemies. The Swedes entered Germany's states, when its troops were at rest, to help the emperor with the bottom of the Rhine in the war which he supported against France. The ministers of this prince, after giving the news of this sudden eruption, advised him to call the Tsar of Russia for help. But this prince, more penetrating than them, answered that the Muscovites were as bears. Better for them to wear their chains, rather than give them to others. He generously took on himself the responsibility of revenge, and he did not take the path of repentance. If I lived in a future century, I would surely lengthen this article with some reflections which could agree with Machiavel, but is not for me to judge the policies of the modern princes. In the world it is necessary to both know how to speak and how to keep silent. The matter of neutrality is as well treated by Machiavel as that of the engagements of the princes. Experience showed for a long time that a neutral prince exposes his country to the insults of the two warring factions, that his states become the theater of the war, and that he always loses by neutrality, without ever having anything solid to gain there. There are two manners by which a prince can become great. One is that of the conquest, where a warlike prince moves back by the force of his weapons the limits of his domination, the other is that of a good government. When a hard prince makes flower in his states all arts and all sciences, which return to him both matured and more organized, all this book is filled only with advice geared to the first manner of increasing power. Let us say something of the second, more innocent, just, and quite as useful as 
the first. The arts most necessary to life are agriculture, trade and manufactures. Those which show the most honor to the human spirit are mathematics, philosophy, astronomy, the eloquence, 